God, thank you for all the things you've been teaching us. I pray that you would help us grow continuously in the things of you, God. I thank you for what you've been doing already through this series, but I pray that today would be another day of just making a small change, but seeing over time this huge difference in our lives. I thank you for the power of your spirit to work with us and through us to uh, become the people you've called us to be. And I just pray there's incredible um, encouragement today throughout this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, and I hope you've been really enjoying the series and seeing the importance how just making a little small thing Uh, a little small change in your life can make actually some big differences. And I hope you've actually even been experiencing that on a personal level over the past few weeks. So, you know, we looked at different areas already. We looked at having like one word to define your year. And and hopefully that was a, a beneficial time of getting alone with God and letting him just show you something for this year. Uh, then we talked about our thought life and why it's important to keep our thoughts under control and making a huge change in there. Last week we talked about our words and the power of our words. Uh, hopefully you uh, talked differently to others this week and to yourself, uh, because I know that has been vital. Today, we're going to turn our attention to our habits, because again, these kind of all feed into each other. There's a connection to our thoughts and our words and then our habits. And and I I just want you to think about this for a moment. While you can know the truth and you can know the importance of the truth and you can believe in the truth, how many of you know, like, actually living the truth is sometimes a challenge. (laughs) You can know it, you can believe it, but actually walking it out is where it becomes very challenging in our lives. And we've all kind of done that, right? We know what we're supposed to do and then we don't do it. And it can be very discouraging and frustrating when we do the opposite of it. And, you know, we tend to excuse those times by calling it, well, it's just out of character, right? Like, that's just not me. Uh, The sad thing is, is that if we're really honest, some of us, what's out of character, actually, if we're honest, it's it's really a habit. We have a habit of being out of character in a way, and um, we, we need to kind of address that. We struggle... We struggle to live out what we know is right in our lives. And so how we do that is connected certainly to having the right thoughts, having the right words, uh, but those things are really setting us up to form the right habits. And this is actually super important because Jesus taught that we're always to be looking beyond words to be able to determine who people really are. And you know what, what's funny is, is we apply that to others, but we're supposed to be applying this to our own lives. And so Jesus was addressing the fact that some people, they were acting a certain way on the outside that, that said, I'm a follower of Christ, but inside they were really wolves. They weren't really truly devoted to God. And he says, the way you can identify this is found in Matthew 7, 16, by their fruit, you will recognize them. And the challenge for today is that what we do matters greatly, but I'm going to tell you how you do what you do is really even more important. It's not just an outward thing. It has to become this inward thing. And so let me explain what we have been really focusing on. We've been focusing so much on this key verse, Zechariah 4, 6. Maybe you have it memorized by now. I hope you do. Uh, but there's a, certain, there's a reason why I'm bringing this up every week. Not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord, right? Uh, that is where we're finding the keys to our success. And so when we're talking about building the right habits this week, we're not talking about doing this in your own power or in your own might. We're talking about letting the spirit empower you into doing the right things. In fact, Jesus taught us the importance of making sure that we have the inside right, which is where we, where we get the power from, is, is the inside of the Holy Spirit that's living inside of us. If we get that right, it does get the outside right. And he says this in Matthew 23, 25 through 26, "'Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup of the dish, and then the outside will also be clean.'" If you've ever washed dishes, you know like how this works, right? You, you clean the outside and the water spills over and inevitably, I mean, you certainly have to wipe around the outside too, but the outside's going to get clean just by washing the inside. And so I want to jump into today learning to have 
how to have these clean habits from the inside and how cleaning the habits on the inside is going to affect the outside of our lives. And so as we get into today, I want to start by pointing out that habits are both good and bad. You know that? I mean, you have good habits and you have bad habits, and you you actually have both. I mean, we all have both, right? We all have some habits that are good, and we all have some habits that are bad. Uh, Another words that we could use for habits that I just want to throw out there are uh, disciplines or character. But our habits are really these things that we do habitually. They usually are patterns in our lives that we have. At the heart of our habits is really this brilliant design of our Creator, I mean, I I don't know if you've ever just thought about your habits and how God wired us to have habits and how this is a a brilliant design. Because listen, if you didn't have habits, every time you had to make a decision, you would have to spend an immense amount of energy and time thinking through how to do this again. And there, there's a, a, an incredible source of energy that would have to come about. So, but God created our brains to begin to form habits so that, guess what? Things become more automatic to us the more we do them. And they actually keep us from having to make those same decisions over and over again and expend all that energy uh, on, on, our, on our day-to-day lives. If we didn't have habits, we'd actually be exhausted. And so you're like, I'm exhausted already. But if you didn't have habits, you'd be even more exhausted in your life because God wired you to help you take that load off of your brain. And so there's a simple illustration that probably most of you can relate to, and some of you, you're going to understand this. And it's, it's like when you learn how to drive. I mean, remember when, when that happened? I mean, all of a sudden, somebody says, hey, here's the go pedal. You push this, and the car goes. But here's the stop pedal, and that's just as important. And here's the steering wheel, and you turn that thing, and that that keeps the car either in your lane or turning. And you have all these mirrors. And so the, the problem is, is that when you first start driving, all of those things can be overwhelming, right? Like putting all of that together can just seem extremely overwhelming to us. And, and it can be very intimidating because you might get one thing right, but then you forget where the brake is or you forget, you know, I, I remember taking driver's ed and this kid kept steering into mailboxes like all the time. And it's like, because he's focused on everything else he's doing, but he wasn't focused on keeping the car straight. <laughs> and, and that's just the way things happen. But listen, some of you, you've been driving 10, 20, 30 years and you probably don't even think about driving anymore, Right. It's just a second nature to you. In fact, while you're driving, you're probably doing other things like thinking about what your day is going to be like. Anybody, you either drove home uh, somewhere from being at work or or you drove to work and you, you never thought about which way you were going, you just automatically drove there. <laughs> or, or you even had a stop on the way home, but you forgot to stop because you're just on automatic pilot. And so you're thinking about all of these other things. Now, There's a bad side to that because sometimes that's really the reason why accidents happen is because your brain's not engaged on what you're supposed to be doing. But generally speaking, we are freed up to focus on other things while, because we have this habit in our life, this, this thing that we do continuously. So those are the power of habits and God wired us to be able to walk through life that way and it actually makes life easier because if you had to keep learning things to do, even your job, think about that, how tedious your job would be if you didn't learn how to just do it over time and it's more habit. I also want you to understand that good habits, they don't restrict your freedoms, they actually open up your life to freedom. Because a lot of people think, well, habits are, are just restrictive. No, actually habits free you up. So I want you to think about this. If, you're, if you have a bad habit with money and you're, str- you're going to be struggling financially your whole life, right? But if you, if, if, uh, why? Because you don't have a good habit. If you have a bad habit of eating, you're going to probably be filled with less energy to get through your day. If you have a, a lack of energy in learning or a lack of ability to ha- have good learning habits, you're going to always feel behind the curve when you're in a group of people around everyone else. And so God's ways are not restrictive, When he gives you a command and he tells you how the best way to do life, it's not to restrict you, it's actually to lead you to life. It's funny how the enemy twists that. He'll be like, oh, God doesn't want you to enjoy something. God wants to restrict you. But the opposite is true. There's incredible freedom and joy in doing things God's way. And so he teaches us some of this through our habits. 
Like he teaches us there's things that are, are very positive that we can learn about his instructions to us through our habits, but oftentimes we don't connect to the lessons. And so the first area I want to look at today is, are, are the habits that are negative and, and those things that are holding us back. And because really, we first have to get rid of those bad things that are laying around in our house before we can start decorating. <laughs> I mean, you can start decorating and have all the junk in your house, but it's not going to look good still. And so we have to really deal with some of this bad in our lives. But most of the time when we think of bad habits, we think of extreme things. We think of like, oh, drugs or drinking too much or lust or even like eating too much. But the Bible has a much broader picture of what, what are these bad habits that we need to deal with. Look what 2 Peter 2.19 says. It says, for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. So certainly those things are bad habits, but most of us in this room, we have to expand that definition because it includes so many other things. Things like, some of us, we're slaves to our job, okay? That, that is the thing that we live for and we're slaves to is our job. Some of us, we're slaves to being jealous. We're, we're constantly looking for whatever somebody else has and we want what they have. And, and there's a slavery that we have to jealousy. Some of us, we're slaves to gossip. We're constantly wanting to tell people what's going on or learn what's going on in other people's lives, and we love spreading it. Some of us, really, we're slaves to being liked and accepted. We just, everyone needs to like me, and if they don't, it ruins our day, and there's just this slavery to it that just drives us to live and serve these things. And so these things are mastering us and these are bad habits that God wants us to throw off. And so we need to understand that our bad habits might not be what everyone else thinks are the big ones, but just like, like we've been seeing throughout this series, listen, a small thing can make a big difference in our life. A small negative thing can bring destruction in your life over time. And this is where we need to recognize that small habits that are bad aren't okay. We need to address, or address it right away. A good example of this is if you take one piece of thread and you were just to pull out something that you sew with, you could easily snap that thing easily, right? But over time, day after day, you add one more thread to there, one more thread to there, one more thread to there, and you start winding those threads together. Eventually, those, that one little tiny thread that you could easily snap becomes unbreakable. And some of us, that's what we feel like in our own habit is that there are some habits that are unbreakable in our lives today and we feel stuck and even bad about it. And the thing is, is God wants us to break th free from those things. I, I find it very encouraging when you look at the Apostle Paul and you look at his life. You know, here's a guy who is one of the most spiritual giants throughout the Bible, and especially in the New Testament. You see his life. Hey, here's a guy who wrote most of the books in the New Testament. He, he's done this incredible spiritual giant who has planted all these churches. And he writes Romans chapter 7 and is completely honest about his struggle with sin. And he says this in Romans 7, 15, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do, but what I hate to do, that is what I do. And anyone who's ever tried to break free from really a struggle in their lives, a habit that they can't seem to break free, free you understand what Paul's saying here, right? Like you, you never know how hard it is to break something until you actually try to stop doing it. For instance, if you're a liar, <laughs> If you try to stop lying, you all of a sudden become aware of how bad lying really is in your life. Like it's, it's got such a hold of your life. You didn't even know the degree that it had on your life till you try to stop it. And so Paul's problem though, it wasn't desire. He wants to do it. He wants to do right. His problem isn't knowledge. He knows what the right thing to do is. His problem is what? He lacks the power to break free. And that's often really what our problem is too. It's not our knowledge, it's not our desire, it's that we lack the power to do what's right and what we know is right. And so he goes on to say this in verse 20, now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. And I want you to understand something that could easily be misread. He's not making an excuse for his sin. 
Okay, he's not excusing it. He's not making an excuse that it's okay to do this. He's just acknowledging that he struggles with sin and that is very much a part of his life still. And by nature, he knows that that sin is pulling him away from what God wants him to do. And we all struggle with sin and we all struggle, when we struggle with sin, we're, we're then trading times of our lives where we're not where God wants us to be. We're not in the life he wants us to be. And so let me show you, though, what's so important because he, is, he's, he has this understanding of, of the struggle and what's going on, but he also understands where that victory is. Listen, when, when the last time you left Sunday service, we all have these times in our lives, there are things where we know what we're supposed to do and we don't do it, right? Maybe it was last week, you know, God, help me control my words. Help me speak life instead of death. And then he got to work on Monday and someone was an idiot and guess what? <laughs> you weren't speaking life anymore, you're speaking death, right? And then Tuesday hit and people were annoying as all get out to you and, and guess what? You're not applying what you know you're supposed to do and what you said you were going to do on Sunday. You're now spewing forth words that are not life, they're death. And then Wednesday comes around and you may remember the lesson from Sunday, but you give up and say, why bother? <laughs> I can't do this thing. And that's what often happens when we strive to do what we know God has called us to do on our own. And so Paul goes on to say this, though, in verse 24 through 25. He gets to the spot where he realizes really the crux of the whole matter. What a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ. And I think this is critical for us to get. Because listen, Paul's struggling so much against his sin. But listen, it's, it's a struggle against sin is the wrong struggle. He, he's not supposed to be in that struggle. The struggle with sin, all that does is point to one reality and one truth. He's a wretch. That's what our struggle with sin shows us. I'm wicked. I can't do this. I'm messed up. But it also points to what? Praise be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. It points us to the fact when you realize that you're a wretch, that you can't do this, where the solution is. And it's to get your eyes off of your sin and on to Jesus who can deliver you from the sin and transform your life. That is the one who sets you free. That's why Jesus says in John 8, 36, so if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And some of us, we've been trying for years to get free by just being self-disciplined. We're trying to discipline ourselves out of the sin we're struggling with or the habits we're struggling with. And all we keep doing is finding out that while I can do good for a little while, I keep falling back into those things. Listen, self, self-discipline will always lead you back to realizing that you can't do it. It only works for a period of time, but there is a freedom that you can have and it's found in Jesus. He's the one that can set you free from those things. In fact, if you've received salvation of Jesus in your life, then this is true about your situation. Look what it says in Romans 8, 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, who raised Christ from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Here's what I want you to know, Christian. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. That same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is able to give you victory over whatever habit you're facing today. He's the one that has the power, the strength, and those things are greater than anything you're up against. Just like we talked about, the battle belongs to the Lord. That's where your victory lies. And so we do have a part, though, in the habits that we form. And God doesn't just come in, take control of our lives, and, and we no longer struggle or have anything going on. He gives us what we need, but we also have to cooperate with his work in our lives. Self-control is actually a fruit of the Holy Spirit. In fact, Galatians 5.25, you know where that fruit is laid, uh, is laid out in scriptures. It points to self-control as being one of the fruits. And so when you have the fruit of, that, of the Holy Spirit in your life, guess what? Self-control is going to be part of that. But that means that the Holy Spirit gives you now the ability to have self-control. It, it comes from remaining in him, which we talked about last week. 
And 2 Peter 1.3 says this, God has given us divine power uh, for everything we need for living a godly life. He's given us everything we need to live a life pleasing to him. And so, but how does that work? I think parents, you can kind of understand this, right, okay? Because if you give your kids, you work really hard to give your kids everything they need to be successful in life. And many of you, you've given them all the tools that they need, but listen, if they don't use what you've given them, their life's gonna be a mess. They're not going to be able to experience really the freedom and the joy that you've set them up for, but you've given them everything they need to succeed. And the same thing happens to you and I with God. God has given us everything that we need for living a godly life, but if we don't cooperate with what he's given or use the gifts that he's given and the talents that he's given, guess what? We're not going to find it being fulfilled in our lives. And it's not God's fault. It's we're not cooperating. We're not using what he's given us. That's why Timothy says this. He says this in 1 Timothy 4, 7, rather train yourself to be godly. We have a certain responsibility in training ourselves in the things of God. And so a big part of this is that we can't just really avoid wrong. We have to begin to start practicing the right habits. And that is what we're gonna really spend the bulk of our time on today because I think so often we, we talk about habits, we talk about the bad, but we don't really talk about striving for the good habits. In Matthew 12, Jesus gives us some insight into what happens when evil is cast out of our lives, but we don't replace that or fill that with something good. We just leave it empty. He says this in Matthew 12, 43 through 45, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I'll return to the house I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Everything's just back to being really good. But then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and live there and the final condition of that person is worse than the first. And here's the challenge. What I have found is that one of the biggest leaps a Christian makes is not this avoiding evil in their lives. It's actually stepping into doing good, into doing what is right. That's a bigger leap than avoiding what's bad. And can I tell you that if you're doing right, you can't actually be doing wrong? <laughs> so if you're, you're doing right, you're actually not able to be doing right and wrong at the same time, otherwise you're doing wrong, right? So there is a challenge there, but listen, you can actually not be doing anything wrong, but also not be doing anything right at the same time too. And that's really the state of many of us. We're, we're not doing anything wrong, but we're actually not doing anything right. And so the life of a Christian is actually described not as sin avoidance. It's actually that we actually do things for God. Jesus described the Christian life this way in Matthew 16, 24 through 25. Jesus said to his disciples, Whatever, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life from me will find it. What does that focus on? Do you see where the focus is on? It's, it's the focus is on the follower of Christ not avoiding sin. There's nothing even about sin. It just says this, deny yourself. You're to be living differently. You're to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus. And then, of course, you and I know that's not easy to do. But that's what the life of a follower of Christ is. You deny yourself, you take up your cross, you follow Jesus. By the way, every sin we commit is done because we're not denying ourselves. The Bible teaches us what is the great commandments? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. All sin is wrapped up into you focusing on yourself and your needs and your desires in an unhealthy and unholy way. And so our sins are always done when we're focused on ourselves. That leads us into sin. It's the, the, the worship of self that sets us up. And so the first part is denying ourselves. The second part is what? Focusing on Jesus. And you simply are less likely to sin when you know that the presence of God is in your midst. Look at the disciples. 
They walked around with Jesus and they were less likely to sin. Now listen, it was still possible to sin. We still see them sinning. I mean, think about who's the greatest. They're arguing about who the greatest is in the presence of Jesus who just washed their feet. And so they're able to sin. They're calling down fire from heaven to wipe out a city just because they didn't receive Jesus. And so you do have the ability to sin in the presence of Jesus, but it certainly won't pop up as much if you begin knowing that you're walking and serving Jesus and you're following him. And Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians that as Christians, we're to be living differently. And when he's writing to the Corinthians, you have to understand Corinth was the home of something known as the Ithmian Games. And so they're they're much like the Olympics, okay? And they would come to town. And so he teaches this analogy in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25, and they would understand it clearly. He says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training and they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So I wanna make it very clear that when Jesus, or when Paul's talking about this, he's not saying you earn your salvation. This is clearly, he's saying, hey, run a race, you've already got heaven, but listen, God's gonna reward you at the end of your life. So run it in such a way that you get those rewards. And the Bible makes it very clear that when we get to heaven, we're gonna stand before God and he's going to judge us for what we've done in our lives. And we're going to be held accountable to those things. And Paul is saying, run in such a way that you get the prize. And so that is way different than the way most Christians are living today. Because so much of us are just happy that we're getting into heaven. We're not running a race. We're not trying to please God or to get a prize. And so let me just ask you this. Are you running to maximize the call of God on your life? Are you running your Christian life to win anything for God? The athletes of these games, they, they go into strict training. They train for 10 months. And they go into strict training. They would, you know, work out. They would really perfect their skills and do them over and over. So they were, they were really high on the level and they could win in their skills. They went on a strict diet. They abstained from alcohol. They didn't uh, indulge in those things. And... So the whole focus for those 10 months was one thing. How can I win? How can I put myself and my body in the best spot that I'm going to win this race? In fact, many would run the race, guess what? (laughs) They'd actually run it naked. And if they didn't run it naked, they got down to as little clothes as possible because they didn't want anything to hinder them from running. Now, I'm not saying that you and I should run the race of God naked. (laughs) Praise the Lord for spandex. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) But listen, this is what Paul is referring to, or or the writer of Hebrews is referring to in Hebrews 12.1. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. He's saying they would understand this. They would get it. Let us put off everything that hinders us so we can win the race. And so think about this for a moment. What is in your life right now that is slowing you down for God? What's one thing in your life right now that's slowing you down for God? Maybe it's just simply you spend too much time watching TV. Or maybe it's the music you're listening to. Or maybe it's you, you have certain friends that you're hanging out with that quite honestly, they're slowing you down. And they're keeping you from really being serious. And the the point is that if you're in a race for God and you're trying to run your life in such a way that pleases God, then there are some things in your life that you're gonna have to start stripping off and letting go of. And the question is, is what might that be? What might the Spirit of God be talking to you about and saying, this is hindering your life right now and if you throw this off, you're gonna be that much closer to winning something great for me. Now let me again, caution something here, and that is this. A person doesn't start off running marathons, right? You start off training and running a little bit and building up so that you eventually can run the marathon. And that's what I'm encouraging us to do today. Start somewhere, somewhere small, so that you know that over time you're going to get to somewhere great for God spiritually. And Paul goes on to say this in verse 26. 
Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. Once again, I would say a lot of Christians are just running aimlessly, at, at least in the spiritual aspect of life. If you were to look at the direction of your life and where it's headed compared to somebody who isn't a Christian, would you see much of a difference? Would you see much of a difference on your goals and what you're striving for and what you're really living for? The problem is, is that many of us are still running in our own direction, in our own race, and we're really not, we're not really pursuing the finish line, we're, we're just pursuing our finish line, whatever that might be. And the finish line you're running, though, it shapes everything you're living for today. It shapes every aspect of your life and how you're living right now. And Paul wants us to understand that just like the athlete gives priority to training and, and living a certain way so that he can win the race, we as Christians are supposed to be doing the exact same thing. We're to be looking at our life and trying to implement the things that will bring us closer to God and honor God and win the life God has given us uh, in, in great ways to see his kingdom advance. And so Paul goes on to use a different analogy for a different game. He goes on to talk about boxing. And the reason he brings up boxing is this is, again, one of the events that they held. And so he says this in verse 26 through 27, I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body that it, and, and make it a slave so that after I have uh, preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Listen, I, I'm personally not a fan of watching people, you know, bash their heads against somebody's fists and, and just to get pummeled in life. But a boxer has to be extremely disciplined. They don't just go into the ring and just start swinging at anything. Why? Because whatever they swing, they want it to land. Because if they don't land that punch, they just expended energy that very well could cause them to lose the match. You get worn out and hit in the air, <laughs> you're not going to be able to really land a strong punch and, and be the victor. And so they're extremely disciplined in what they're doing and how they're doing it. And so a boxer knows how to win a fight. They look for the open opportunities. They look when somebody else's guard is down and then they strike. And there is something that I think we can learn from that is that, listen, their winning didn't just happen. They were strategic. They knew when their chance was. And it's one thing I think many of us, again, needs to wake up to. I think too many of us were content on just living our lives by chance. And it's really not a disciplined life that's ready and looking for an opening to accomplish what God has called you to do. So I believe every day there's divine appointments in our life. It's just not, we don't just have a chance to live. And here's why. If a, in a moment, a life can change. When is that moment? And why can't it be right now? But most of the time we think someday, someday, someday. But someday is now. And those that are running to win the race they're looking for those open opportunities to accomplish something for God in their life. And I just want you to think about this. What if everyone in our church became more focused on training and running this race for God and his kingdom? Can you imagine the impact the church of Christ, not even just ours, but the church of Christ would be here on this earth and in this world if we lived for the kingdom of God and that was our primary focus? of what we were striving to do with our lives. Listen, as we close today, there is an interesting law of physics that I think will help us get started. And many of you might remember this. It's Newton's law of motion. And it simply is this. Something that is not in motion will stay not in motion, but something in motion tends to stay in motion. It's really, really brilliant, right? <laughs> But it's true, and I want you to think why that's so important for our lives. Because many, many of us, our biggest challenge is this, get in motion. <laughs> You've been sitting too long doing nothing. And if you would get in motion, what you would find is that that small little step into doing something for God becomes a bigger motion in your life, and you begin doing bigger things over time. 
I know we focus on two key areas, but I really believe that the greatest area is for us to realize we're in a race, that we're in this race for God. God has called you to do something with your life. And if God has called you to do something in your life, then we need to make sure we're taking how we live it seriously and developing the godly habits that God wants us to have that will help us win. And so what is one habit that you need to add to your life now that will help you run your race better? Just one, one thing, one small thing that will help you run your race better. It just might be that you spend time reevaluating the race you're truly running right now. And you might find that, you know what, I've been running this race in my life well in this world, but it's not a spiritual race. Here's what I think is really cool. The tools that you use to be successful in this life are often the very tools that God will use in your life to be successful in your spiritual life. And you've already mastered them. You just need to remaster them on a spiritual level. And start there. Start with what God has already showed you that you're good at. Of course, there are those of us who are struggling with the sin habits. And we, we looked at our victory coming through Jesus and how important that is. But I want to point back again to our key verse. Zechariah 4, 6, it's not going to be won through your might or your power, but by your spirit, says the Lord. Your victory is going to come not in your own power. It's going to come through Jesus, who is the one who can rescue you from the wretched person you are. And again, thank God he saved you. Stand in your salvation. Walk in your salvation. Your victory comes when your focus actually turns away from sin and towards God. And so I hope that this will bring this home for some of you because there's an illustration I use often. I'll probably use it again, but I think it just paints a picture of really our struggle and why it's not against sin and why it needs to really turn towards God. Here, here's just my challenge. Where you're sitting right now, I just want you to do one thing. Stop thinking about blue. All right? Don't think about blue anymore. Just stop thinking about blue. You know what ends up happening? The harder you try to fight against thinking about blue, the more you end up reinforcing blue in your mind. And you don't have victory over blue. You actually reinforce blue. And so that's what some of us have been trying to do with our sin. Stop doing it. Stop doing this. And we're not finding victory in it. But if I tell you this, start thinking about green and everything that is around us that is filled with green in this place. Think about the wall. <laughs> Think about the tree. Think about green. You know what you stop doing? You automatically stop thinking about blue. Because you can't think about two things at once. And I just know that a big key to our victory over bad habits is when we stop focusing on the habit and turn them to Jesus. That's what we're taught in scripture. That's what he focuses our attention on, that we find victory because we, we stop looking at what has held us in bondage and we start looking to the one that set us free. In many cases, that is the struggle that we're walking in to have the victory we need is, is we're just focused on trying to overcome the sin. And what you've done is you're trying to use Self-discipline then. You're trying to do it in your own power and your own might. But if you focus on Jesus and what he's done for you and turn your attention to him, you're gonna find that that's a big part of the key of that bondage falling off and those chains being broken. So would you bow your heads and pray with me today. Jesus, thank you for the power and victory of Jesus in our lives. And God, I know that there are people in this room who Lord, they are in bondage to certain things. And Lord, they totally get Paul. Lord, they are believers who have a strong faith and yet they know what to do, they believe what they need to do and they find themselves not able to do it. They very much identify God as a wretch and Satan has easily brought condemnation on their life. God, I thank you that Paul follows up 
Romans 7 with Romans chapter 8. But therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And God, our victory is not in what we do, how well we can maintain our walk with you and avoid sin. It is literally in what you've done for us. And that never changes. And I just pray that we would start there, God. Whenever we're walking into a situation where we're in condemnation, that we would just start with, yes, I'm a child of God. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And I thank you for that. And I know that's a start, but God, I pray that there would be victory, Lord. And a lot of that is, I, I just believe very strongly, going to happen when we, when we really become focused with all of our energy and all of our might on running the race you've called us to, God. I know there's many people in this room, Lord, that if we're honest, we look at our lives, we look at the world around us, and there's not much difference between what we're living for and what they're living for. But God, that is that's so not what being a follower of Christ is supposed to be. And I, I believe it's the root of so many of our problems and so many of our bad habits. And I just pray that Lord, as we lay our hearts before you this week, that you would begin to show us just one thing that we could do that could help us start running this race for you, God. And I pray that because we do that, Lord, it might be a small thing, but God, I pray that it becomes this big thing. That your kingdom is advanced, that your purposes are are brought to this earth, God, and that truly change can happen, God. And I thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love, God. May, may we walk, Lord, in freedom from bad habits, but may we also walk, Lord, in the freedom and grace of good habits. And I thank you for your work of your spirit inside of us to accomplish all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.